really worth the price. The uh, strong arm tactics can elicit a certain kind of information. It can get a subject to tell you where a troop is located, who his best friend is, but it cannot elicit the kind of continuing dialogue that will yield strategic intelligence, which is what, after all, you really need in a war zone. Faced with a new set of challenges in the 21st century, the debate continues about how far interrogators should be allowed to go. Well, the search continues for the most effective ways of getting people to talk who don't want to. I want to tell you something about the television series proposal I'm working on. It's based on my history as a Central Intelligence Agency operative and on my misadventures as a guerrilla journalist. Cold open. Two gloved hands unspool a strand of piano wire. Smooth out the crimps. Attach wooden handles to each end. The woman's neck is porcelain pale, with the graceful curve of a Modigliani model, a shadow just beneath the jawline. Suddenly, the wire whips across it, tightens, bites in. A crackling sound, like sinew and bone bursting. The severed head topples to the floor, the glass eyes of the mannequin splintering on impact. Frank and his daddy guys reading Little Red Riding Hood to his daughter's kindergarten class as other parents listen in. But he doesn't like the part where the wolf gobbles up old grandma, so he changes it. This time, Little Red shows up, whips out a sap, whops the wolf on the nose, and knocks him out cold. Wild applause from all the kids. Paige's daughter shouts out, way to go, Dad, and maybe she cut off his ears, too. Worried looks from the other parents. They're not sure they're comfortable with Frank's R-rated persona and its glimmerings in his daughter. Throughout the war, 80% of North Vietnamese materiel bound for South Vietnam had not been coming down the Ho Chi Minh Trail system, as we thought. CIA and Special Forces officers look for any advantage. We wanted to find out what kind of beer they liked. By the way, Budweiser was the preferred beer, and we would often plant uh, sabotage Budweiser along the Ho Chi Minh Trail system because we knew they would stop, take a little sip, and if the bomb worked right, they'd be blown up. We also spent a lot of time trying to determine what kind of cigarettes uh, Ho Chi Minh liked, Salem cigarettes. We wanted to be able to poison them and thus do him in. As in every war, letters home are scanned for intelligence. I spent a lot of time reading love letters, captured love letters, uh, taken from the bodies of communist cadre, particularly letters that related to stops along the trail, bridges that were strategic or certainly tactical pieces of intelligence that we could plug into our picture to better target or bombing campaign. Eventually, even CIA operatives call it an assassination program. The CIA was claiming that our assassination counter-terror program, the Phoenix program, was killing a lot of high-ranking communist cadre. I looked at some statistics showing the, the numbers of communist cadre over the years, and they hadn't diminished. We were killing somebody, but they weren't the right Vietnamese. It was also apparent to me, as time went on, that we were never going to see a change in the paranoid quality of the South Vietnamese leadership, in part because we didn't want to see the paranoia. If you create a government, you create a puppet government, you create a protege government. The last thing you want to do is to admit that it has weaknesses. We in the CIA never reported extensively on the corruption within the South Vietnamese government, the weakness of the South Vietnamese military, the lack of security in the countryside. So we didn't realize how fragile the situation was. We are, I think, committing those same errors Sure, we've been spying on the Maliki government, just as we spied on Nguyen Van Thieu, 
but what we are not doing and, and, and find it very difficult to do in any context like this is to find fault with your protege. In Iraq, as in Vietnam, uh, how can you easily induce the population to coalesce and fight for their own uh, uh, interests if the Americans are always, always providing the security and always managing the infrastructure and, most importantly, the money? During the period of Vietnamization, the South Vietnamese had a good shot but they were plagued by the very problems that are plaguing uh, Petraeus' uh, uh, Iraqis and the Iraqis during this period of Iraqiization, if you could put it that way. And that is, you, you will never overcome the paranoia between the central force, the central government, and the localities. Sure, uh, Anbar province looks pretty secure, but never forget it was because American forces were right there backing them up, special forces. Okay, we'll do more of it in the future. Okay. The same was true in Vietnam during the period of Vietnamization. If the drawdown occurs and we discover this, that the Iraqi army is still rife with corruption, unconnected uh, to the leadership, uh, and certainly not uh, at all attentive to the sectarian divisions that divide the country, in fact, is a force for continued sectarian violence, you're not going to have an outcome that's any different from what we saw in the last days of the Vietnam War. I fear. I fear. The U.S. Embassy in Saigon. The CIA occupied the top three floors. These rooms once housed the largest CIA station in the world. It was the last building abandoned when Americans pulled out. Only a few of their Vietnamese helpers escaped with them. This room, which is so barren now, was the CIA primary radio room. And uh, a lot of CIA operatives carried little radios on their belt known as diamond net radios. That was sort of the code word for the system. And they left these radios strewn around Saigon. And Vietnamese who'd been left behind were grabbing up these radios and calling in. And I remember very vividly standing in this room with voices coming in over the radio circuits, Vietnamese calling for help, desperate for help. I'm Mr. Han, the translator. Come rescue me. I'm, I'm Miss... Uh, Chi, uh, your driver, please don't forget me. I have my mother here who will be killed by the communists. In fact, it's a, a memory of the last day that has never left me. I have been plagued with nightmares. I call them sound mares of Vietnamese screaming over this radio for help, and these walls literally seem to reverberate with their cries of panic. I saw it as the most heinous betrayal of our friends. The only thing you have to offer a source is loyalty and the assurance you will take care of. And when you abandon a source, you'll never hire or recruit a new source. They'll never trust you. And so what we did in Vietnam those final days was to commit the one error that an intelligence officer must never make. We let people who work for us see that in a crunch, we wouldn't do anything to help them. 